I'm off the ground today. Uh, I walked into the studio with everything that I needed, but I didn't bring my water in, my water bottle. So you know what's going to happen. I could do a whole show for two hours without a sip of that if it was sitting here. But since it's sitting out on my desk about halfway across the building, in about the next 10 minutes, my throat's going to get all tickly and scratchy, and I'm going to be sitting here hacking on the air because it's in the other room. That's it, it's, it's like remembering, or forgetting rather, to leave the house without a handkerchief. That's the day you're going to end up with a lot of allergies and sneezing. And, and we won't go into how you solve that problem. Uh, I'm not a child anymore. I'm not allowed to use my sleeves. We have a lot going on today. Randy Staples will be joining us in about half an hour with his Idaho Weekly report, or briefing, if you will, chatting with us about a few issues related to uh, what's going on around the state. I also have a, a, a story coming out of Washington. Department of Homeland Security uh, says that uh, right-wing Americans, once again, could be plotting dangerous activities across the country. But Islamists are not extremists. Extremists are just extremists of any kind. So we, 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 we can't, can't say anything about Islamic extremism. That would be wrong. But when it comes to Tea Party extremism, that would be right. So details on that coming up a little later in the program as well. But right off the top, I just wanted to mention the Academy Awards last night. I know some of you may have decided to watch it. I, I Long, long ago, I made a decision in my life that these award shows just bore me silly, that it would be a waste of time to watch them. And it started before I went to bed, but I did not catch any of it. I went off to La La Land and, and just forgot about it knowing, even though the Drudge Report was hoping that American Sniper would get nominated as Best Picture, knew it wasn't going to happen. And the Academy did the safe thing. They decided to appease all of the political uh, the political ranting going on this year because, as you know, one side claimed it was mean that Selma didn't get many nominations. This is not really a great film. Unlike They, they didn't complain at all. Uh, somehow they feel it is racist that the movie didn't get nominations even though 12 Years a Slave recently did very, very well at the Academy Awards. So they, they overlook that, but apparently now every year is part of the reparations deal. A, a movie about a figure that was, a, was a, a black American has to be nominated for Best Picture and likely has to be given the statue for Best Picture. I haven't quite figured that one out yet. So there was all of this screaming on the American left about how uh, this was just a total, total uh, a diss of the, the, uh, the well, people of color really across the country. And then when there was a nomination for American Sniper, it started. They started bringing up all of the old issues they had with the war in Iraq, how awful it was, how awful the, the, the character, the main character portrayed in the movie was. And this just went on and on. And even the Washington Post fact checker wrote a column fact checking the movie because sometimes in movies, you have to, in a two-hour story or two-and-a-half-hour story, it may have been in this case, you have to sort of shoehorn some details together. So one event that may have happened in one tour of duty for Chris Kyle was pushed into the movie as two events taking place, even though it, the events took place, but the timeline for the movie's sake was altered occasionally. So it was ripped apart by the Washington Post fact-checker. And you know there was pressure on these Academy members they could not give this movie best picture. It may have been. It was a tremendous film. I saw it a few weeks ago. But they could not do it for political reasons. They would not have been able. I know it said that a lot of them are anonymous, but I'm sure a lot of people in Hollywood know exactly who they are. That they would not have been able to go to all of their parties, snort their cocaine, and hold their heads up high afterward if they had given the Academy Award nomination for best picture to American Sniper. So for that reason, they picked a film called Birdman that nobody has seen. I, there might be 13 people on the West Coast who went to see it, and perhaps a couple just got into the wrong theater in Nebraska, so we might be up to 15 people who actually saw that movie. And it is now Best Picture. It's, it's how they got a, a, around it all, because they, they, they figured, well, this will appease the Selma crowd who are angry, and this will appease the other leftists who are angry about American Sniper. And so that choice was made. It's not unusual. I have a friend who was on the air with me just on Friday morning. His dad was once nominated for an Academy Award back in the 1970s. And he told me, he said, it's, a, it's, a, it's an entirely political contest. He, he left me a comment this morning on Facebook about it. And, and so I, I tend to agree. These are people who are not out looking to, uh, to pick the best, and that's unfortunate. 
And there are marketing campaigns going on in the background. And as I say, there are campaigns to discredit films. So here you go. Uh, the left has triumphs, uh, triumphed once again in the United States. At some point, though, and I th think that most people who listen to this program mornings understand this, Lefty and his god, the fellow in the, the fiery place, can continue to win battles all they want, but ultimately they're not going to win the war. Our guy is, is he's more powerful. And for that reason, they can gloat all they want, but it's, it's, it's going to be a very temporal thing, and, and it will pass. We have a lot of other things I'd like to talk about today on the program, and, and it just I had to get that, that off my chest, though, near the top of the show, because I'm sure a lot of you people would agree with me and feel the same way about that, especially if you saw some of these movies. You knew that American Sniper was head and shoulders above any other, but we don't celebrate patriots anymore in Hollywood. Uh, that's considered to be, uh, I think the French word is it pronounced de rigueur. In other words, you just you stay away from it. And, and well, frankly, there aren't many patriots who are working in Hollywood. There's only a handful, Vince Vaughn and uh, perhaps Clint Eastwood and, and a couple of others, uh, Kelsey Grammer. Uh, but those people are being more and more marginalized all of the time because of the views that they happen to hold. It's 813. Bill Colley with you on KLIX. This is News Radio 1310 KLIX. We're heard all around the world, too, as well. Online at newsradio1310.com. Our telephone number, if you'd like to reach the program today, 736 0300. 736 0300. I do have to mention it's 18 right now at our studios. It has been a while since we have felt a chill like this. On Friday afternoon, I was at the Home and Garden Show. I spent a couple of hours there that day, and uh, Brad, the boss, was telling me, he said, Don't get used to the notion that Februaries are always like this where we have 60-degree temperatures and plenty of sunshine. He said, normally it's worse. Well, it got worse over the weekend. It, it cooled off a bit, and we're seeing that. On the other hand, my sister woke today to a temperature of 6 below zero. She's been getting used to this. She hasn't seen a temperature above freezing all month, and her high temperature today is expected to be 1. So I guess I'll take 18. I mean, relatively speaking, relatively speaking, I'll take 18. I think it's a, it, it's not pleasant, but... We'll get through this. We only have a few more weeks of this really nasty weather. And then, yeah, nasty. 18 and no wind. But we'll get through it. And then things will be a lot brighter and a lot nicer. And some of the other things we're going to be talking about this morning, if I don't get a chance to bring it up a little bit later. After I got out of church yesterday, I headed back to the Home and Garden Show. In fact, I had a great time at the Home and Garden Show. Met some really wonderful people there. I met a man on Friday who is, uh, he's, he, he was in World War II. He was in uh, the last jump into uh, by paratroopers into uh, Germany during the war. In fact, I had just finished reading about this in the book, uh, Max Hastings' book about the final year of the war called Armageddon a week before. And he was in Operation Varsity. He jumped behind the lines, in fact, jumped behind the Rhine River. Now, a lot of people, military historians say it wasn't necessary to make the jump, and I brought that up, and the man said, well, still won. <laughs> yes, you did. Very much so. Uh, and so we, we have to give them credit for that. But I had a wonderful time. He and his brother came by the booth. We got a chance to talk for a few minutes. I also met some people yesterday who dropped by the booth, a great many of them. And I was talking to two young people who are members of the Twin Falls Youth Council. That is, they are a shadow uh, government to the city council. And they're going to be joining us sometime in the next few week, weeks on the program to talk with us as well. And some of them may end up being in a few years, members of that actual city council, which I think would be a wonderful thing. After talking to this uh, this young man and this young woman, I get the impression they're far more mature for their years than a lot of the other people I meet who are who are in their teen years. And they are far more mature at their age than I certainly was when I was their age. I give them some great credit. And you know what that comes down to? Great parenting. So I, I finally got out of the home show about 4.30 yesterday, and I went home. I had to make a couple of calls to some family members who, uh, who hadn't heard from me all day, and I, I called them and said hello. And when I finally got done, I took a look at the Times News. Yes, uh, uh, Twin Falls, the most popular newspaper. As somebody told me yesterday, she, in fact, the woman came by the booth and she said, she said she once put an ad in this newspaper, and she said, you know, the only people who came into my store and said they'd seen the ad were all old people. Yes, because nobody under the age of 50 really reads newspapers anymore. And I'm just barely above that list. So I'm one of the last groups of people who actually will look at a newspaper now and then. I know people say, well, get yourself a Kindle, get rid of all those books and things like that. I just I love the feel of something in my hands while I'm sipping a hot cup of coffee. But as usual, there's a great many things that I find 
unusual about the approach that newspapers take with how they report news. The editorial pages just make steam pour out of my ears. Some guy writing there yesterday about how the tax system soon is going to favor the wealthy and the middle class and poor will carry all of the burden. Do you realize in Twin Falls how many businesses have opened here in the last 10 years? And we, we talk a little bit about how the tax system favors the rich. But think about it for a moment. Think about all those businesses and the couple of thousand jobs that have been provided in this area because those people who got tax breaks at the top simply turned around and reinvested their money. And they gave you jobs. There was no real recession in this area compared to the rest of the country over the last half dozen years. And why again? Well, maybe it's that tax system, but they will not, the Libbies will not acknowledge that. So the fact that you have a job and maybe you didn't five or six years ago is irrelevant to them. Somebody else somewhere is, is having a better time perhaps than you are. What is it, the old Margaret Thatcher line, when she was criticized in Parliament one day, she said, here's the real truth about a liberal policy. She said, they're angry that uh, the wealthier got richer, even while everybody else got richer too. And there's, there's truth in that. They would rather have the poor be poorer as long as the, uh, the rich could be poorer too. And, and that's how they see the world. But on the front page of the paper yesterday, and those of you who like to read the ag news, you have to really dig through the paper. And so if you're a traditional Idahoan who likes to read the ag news, what you were faced with was this, a couple of stories on the front page. Legal wrangling over same-sex marriage? A recap. And here's another one. A marriage like any other with a couple of photographs. And they're, they're affiliated somewhat with the Washington Post because they're promoting both their website and the Post website lately. The Post had a story yesterday on the op-ed pages. A woman was writing, and she said, I am a lesbian, and I hope my daughter grows up to be gay, too. It's a wonderful lifestyle. Okay, well, let's ask your daughter her opinion on that. But the newspapers, especially the front pages any longer, you just know that they sit around and think to themselves, we have to promote this. Gay. Gay, 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 gay. And while I don't really care, it just seems to me it's a little bit overblown because maybe they feel if they can't get anybody else to buy an actual hard copy of the newspaper if they just keep promoting all of this, that they'll at least be able to pick up a few customers in that in that particular community. And the other thing I just don't understand, I don't really care what people do in their personal lives. I have my own beliefs, but I do not try and kick down your door and force you to believe them. But why is it that these women involved in these relationships have to cut their hair off? Is it some, you know, how many of them actually have long hair? Is, is this some sort of uniform? Maybe somebody out there can answer that question for me. But once somebody decides they're going to be in one of these relationships, it always seems they go get their hair cut really, really short. Why, why don't you just get a shirt and you know, put a big L on it, and then we can figure out that's your team. You don't have to worry about the haircut. And you can grow the hair at any length you want. Look, we've got a lot to talk about today. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security says if you're a conservative, you're an extremist and perhaps a terrorist. More details on that ahead. As I mentioned a, a little earlier, we're going to be joined by Randy Staples in about 15 minutes, and he'll be talking with us about his Idaho Weekly Briefing. He lists gas prices around the state, where they happen to be last week, compiled. And the cheapest is way up in the, the northern corner of the panhandle. And I noticed driving down the highway yesterday, we've seen a slight increase over the last week to 10 days. Uh, we're up to, in some places, a little over a buck ninety per gallon right now, which, after I was paying a few weeks ago, a buck fifty something per gallon, seems a little harsh, but it's still well below what I've been paying for in the last few years. So, again, we get into these relative discussions. It's 18 at our studios. You're listening to Bill Colley this morning on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX. And all around the world at NewsRadio1310.com, you can reach our program by giving me a shout at 736-0300. That is 736-0300. You can also email me at Bill.Colley. That is spelled C-O-L-L-E-Y. Bill.Colley at townsquaremedia.com. 825 at our studios this morning. I was talking about the, the gasoline situation because, according to the Wall Street Journal, prices are going to start not just creeping back up, but we may see some lurches where they take some big, steep swings upward in the next coming, well, several months. And that is because with the prices so low, a lot more people are going out and buying the F-150s, maybe even the 250s and the Dodge Rams and the Chevy Silverados, and they're driving those around. And, of course, the feeling is they use a lot more fuel. And all around the world, people are now buying bigger vehicles for the very same reason. Government wants you to drive smaller, you know, force you to drive smaller. You would prefer to drive larger, and you're willing to pay the price. 
But uh, the, the idea that you don't have the liberty to drive a bigger vehicle really annoys, of course, the, the left in this country because they want to make sure that you eat the right foods uh, and that you take care of the, the planet for them. You may have a differing view on it, but your view doesn't matter. You've got to, They always talk about compromise, how Republicans won't compromise, but when it comes to the environmental fanatics, there ain't no compromise, folks. You understand how that goes. And then the Associated Press today out of Idaho reporting, the federal government predicts that trains hauling crude oil or ethanol will derail an average of 10 times a year over the next two decades. Now, I don't know if that's a lot. I remember a train der derailment in 1976 when I was a, just a little boy. It happened. The railroad near my house, the old Erie Railroad, ran like a big horseshoe around my little hometown. It derailed on April Fool's Day. Just as a, a group called Conrail took over the tracks, and people thought that was a rather strong April Fool's Day message in all of that. And one of my friends uh, it woke him up because a, a train car ended up in his backyard. He said he thought that his sister had fallen down the stairwell. She was a rather large girl, but um, it was one of those situations where we, we were used to the idea that trains might go off the tracks now and then. It does happen. It's, it's not a perfect, uh, perfect way to travel. Maybe safer, though, still than a tanker going down the road hauling all of this stuff, and perhaps much safer than a tanker going down the road hauling all of this stuff. The writer says the study took on new relevance last week after a train loaded with oil derailed in West Virginia, causing a spectacular fire. If people went out and sat down and started eating popcorn, watching it, saying, hey, wait for the third act. And it forced hundreds of families to evacuate. Now, I don't know, again, if, if, if a 10 of these a year is considered high, or is it, if it's considered low, or is it average. I do know that the people in government who are making these predictions are likely, well, leftist environmentalists, and they're going to exaggerate the threat. On the other hand, if they would go ahead and approve the Keystone XL pipeline, we would have far fewer trains hauling oil across the country now, wouldn't we? But we can't approve the Keystone XL pipeline because, well, we've answered all of the environmental questions. No, there would be no harm to any uh, little creatures, fuzzy creatures, no harm to the prairie dogs, the buffalo, or any antelope. But we can't have it because why? Well, because it's going to transport oil. Well, we're already transporting oil. Yes, but we've got to stop transporting oil. You see, that's the point from Lefty. You've got to end it all together because if you just follow his advice and slap yourself a lot on cold days, you'll generate some heat and stay warm. And if you go to Portland and we all move there, every one of us, we can live in a cinder block high rise and ride our bicycles or public transportation, which will all be fueled, uh, the public transportation, of course, by a giant pinwheel every 60 feet. You won't be able to see the sun anymore because of that, but don't worry. Uh, the sun, of course, is going to be our later source of fuel once the pinwheels don't work. And once we knock all of them down, kill every bat and bird in the world, uh, well, that's just an acceptable loss, according to Lefty. You know, that's collateral damage. Uh, they have their own version of that. It's 828 now. Bill Colley with you this Monday morning. And again, it's a chilly morning. It's a chilly start to our day. The global warming has just been plaguing the country for weeks now. 19 at our studios. Fox News just had a map up on a graphical map up on the screen uh, a short while ago. Uh, Maria, what's her name? The uh, the very short weather person. I only know this because I saw her standing outside one day next to the rest of the cast. She's about four and a half feet tall. Uh, Melina, that's it. She was standing in front of a graphical map that showed you how cold it was across about 15 states where they're experiencing a lot of those below zero temperatures this morning. See, that's why they don't call it global warming anymore, because we started giggling at them when they did that, and it would drop down below zero, so it's, it's climate change now. But we can't address that with the Keystone XL pipeline, uh, because of that will only make things worse. The planet will fly, fly to a crisp. Just ask them. Uh, they've got uh, their crystal balls out, and they know this for sure. 29 minutes coming up on 8.30. 29 minutes after 8 o'clock. Bill Colley with you on this top story. Randy Staple is to join us between 8.40 and 9 o'clock this morning from Idaho Weekly Briefing. And I've got a lot more to talk about this morning, too. <laughs> There's a story about battery life in the Wall Street Journal, and it's one of the most looked-at stories on the website. People fed up with the fact that their battery life for their cell phones. We have a lot of great concerns in America. Forget about this ISIS and, you know, lack of jobs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. My battery doesn't stay charged for very long. Details in some of these stories likely ahead. Now, I just wanted to tell you, I... Took a look at the website for uh, the Twin Falls Times News. And yesterday's uh, big story with all the photographs and everything else actually is not among the five most read stories for the newspaper of the week. 
But again, it's you know, an editorial board and people there who they are not covering news for facts anymore. They're trying to tell you the stories they want to promote, that they, you know, their worldview. That's what it's about. And it's trying to convince you that they're right, you're all wrong. And if you don't agree, there's a story out in the New York Times today. And this is this is how I'm, I'll phrase it this way. This is what they're really up to. Rudolph Giuliani, the former mayor of New York City. Now, I would not say Rudolph Giuliani is a terribly libertarian Republican. Uh, he had some notions about law enforcement that a lot of people thought were a little heavy-handed, a little bit big government. And I know that he is a Roman Catholic, but even among many people of his faith, his co-religionists, I'm one of them, we feel that he doesn't live up to his faith, that he, he has some shortcomings there. But when he was mayor of New York City and 9-11 took place, the man displayed the true skills of leadership that very few people today in American politics actually have. If you were living under a rock last week, you may have missed the story, but he questioned the president's patriotism. And that sent left-wing media, which is, what, 99% of it, into a tizzy in this country. He must apologize, and anybody else who heard him speak must apologize. Why? Scott Walker didn't say it. Rudolph Giuliani said it. Yes, but Walker was there, so he needs to denounce it. Well, why does he need to denounce it? Because we liberals say so. Well, he's not a liberal. He should be, and just because he isn't, we're going to do some bad stories about the fact that he never went to uh, finished college. And so, therefore, he's unfit to be president. And he won't apologize for something Rudolph Giuliani said. Yeah, but Rudolph Giuliani was right. What do you mean he was right? He, he was spot on. President Obama doesn't like America. His wife even went so far as to say it. When he got elected president, she finally said she had finally decided to like America, but she hated it up to that point. And he sat in that church where that reverend screamed, No, 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 no! Not God bless America! And you remember the rest of it. I just don't want to repeat it today. It's, it's not very nice on a morning radio show. So here's Giuliani saying all of this. But all he said was, I don't think he's a, he's a patriot. And then he said, well, let me clarify that. He's a communist. <laughs> oh, good Lord. It was like throwing kerosene on the fire. Uh, never mind ISIS and terrorists. And uh, never mind uh, the sluggish, uh, continued sluggish economy. We have to spend all of our time talking about this now for the next several weeks. So the New York Times today is accusing Giuliani of being racist. Well, he didn't say anything about color of Obama's skin. I, you know, he came up later on, but you know, he pointed out, he said, well, you know, his mother was white, so it's a little difficult to sit here and scream racism all the time. Somebody brought that up, I guess, tangentially with him last week. But all he said was the guy wasn't patriotic and was a communist. The N-word didn't come in there anywhere. Uh, communist may be a C-word and lack of patriotism, lack of a P-word. But according to the New York Times today, Rudolph Giuliani is a racist. Why? Well, he criticized the president, you know. Well, what's wrong with dissent? Hillary Clinton used to say it was the highest form of patriotism. Well, yes, but she was talking about Republicans now, wasn't she? Uh, that doesn't count. So when we're talking about uh, President Obama, a transformational figure, of course it's transformational. He's turning it into a communist country. Yeah, that's transformational, all right. They're just it's semantics. It's a euphemism. They want you to pay no attention to what he really means. It's transformational change. Can't you feel the tingle up your legs? That's my sciatica in my case. I don't know what Chris Matthews, it's something very, very strange going on there. But I got to tell you, <laughs> I don't think the media realizes this. About 150 to 250 million people sat there and heard that story and said, yeah, that's pretty much accurate. But they, they don't want you to believe that. You, you're wrong, according to them. Uh, they are right. Uh, they've been eating all sorts of granola and smoking all of the marijuana in this country for the last 50 years. And that has enlightened them. And they're journalists, too, which means God has given them some special powers that you just simply lack. So if you don't understand this, then you have to be browbeaten just like Giuliani is being browbeaten by these people. It's 8.38. Randy Staples will be joining us for a few minutes in the next segment of the program. He'll be talking with us uh, about uh, some, uh, well, I think some very important issues going on, of course, in Boise and elsewhere. He's also, he, he had a piece in the Idaho Weekly Briefing where he was uh, actually talking, too, about a, a national proposal that is backed by your two U.S. senators who are Republicans. You know, see, that's the thing. A lot of this liberal media stuff just will not sell around here. Because the, the, the entire population of liberals in our listening area, 
that is our broadcast area, I mean, they could caucus in a closet. I'm surprised they'd even come out of the closet because they are just such a tiny, tiny minority. But we'll be talking with Randy in a few minutes, who I think, from my perspective, I don't know the man. I, it was introduced to him on the program because he was already a regular Monday guest. But I'll tell you what, he strikes me as being a guy who's, who's willing to be fair and listen to both sides of an argument. And, uh, and he, so he's not, a, he's not a knee-jerk liberal. Maybe that's why he's not working at an actual newspaper anymore. Maybe they wouldn't, you know, he, he had to come in one day with his liberal card, and the liberal guild said, oh, you know, we're not going to punch your ticket any longer. So he struck out on his own. We've got more coming up with him in just a few minutes. He'll be talking about a, 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 something called SCRAP. That's an acronym. We'll tell you what that actually stands for. That's on the way on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Bill Colley with you this morning until 10 o'clock. Whether you like it or not, well, I might have a heart attack between then, the way things are going. 18 at our studios, it's 840. As I was mentioning a few minutes ago, we are joined this morning, as we are on most Monday mornings uh, during this uh, time slot, by Randy Stapleis from the Idaho Weekly Briefing. And he takes some time to talk with us about. Events going on, uh, not always just in Boise, uh, where state government, of course, is uh, making the sausage right now, but also sometimes uh, events that take place far away in Washington, especially if they involve our local congressional delegation. And uh, he's, uh, he's spending some time with us again this morning. It's 844, just turned 844. It's 19, uh, balmy 19 at our studios here at the Miami of the North. And this is News Radio 1310 KLIX and NewsRadio 1310.com. Bill Colley with you on Top Story. And, Randy, welcome back to the show. Well, good to be back. Hey, something I saw on the, the briefing uh, caught my attention right away this morning because there was an editorial in the Times News yesterday about uh, the tax structure and how the writer felt it was increasingly favoring the wealthy in Idaho. But uh, Idaho Weekly Briefing uh, also says, and I don't know that this is contradictory, but it does, does tell us something about the tax structure. Idaho is really the ninth best in the nation, at least when it comes to what you have to shell out? Well, it's uh, it's ninth lowest overall, according to the uh, report by the State Tax Commission. And it, from what I can see of it, and I've, I've glanced through the report, and uh, it uh, appears to be a pretty straightforward kind of thing. I I think that it is it is uh, lower than uh, than most states, uh, the tax rates overall in Idaho. But of course, that's a different question from how you, in relative terms, tax various kinds of people in various kinds of ways. Those, you know, those would be two different, uh, two different kinds of issues. So it's really an amalgamation. It just, it, it's totaling everything up and saying, here's the overall, right? Right. Yeah. That, uh, that uh, Idaho's is, is lowest and that really should, or one of the lowest, and that really shouldn't come as much of any kind of surprise uh, particularly because Idaho has had uh, has been electing uh, state legislatures and uh, and governors for quite some time who have been pretty well dedicated to avoiding increases and and doing cuts wherever uh, wherever they can find them and wherever they can collect the votes to get them. Now tomorrow the governor is going to join us on the show and he will talk a little bit about some of the transportation issues, which clearly still are going to be dogging the folks in Boise because. Uh, and, and and I've heard it. I, I get mixed calls from people who are listening to the show about the condition of the roads. Clearly, the interstates uh, seem to be in relatively good shape, but it's when you get off the interstates that there are still a great many concerns, and you can't necessarily see the corrosion perhaps going on beneath a bridge when you drive over it. Well, that's true, and sometimes the uh, the the real damage in the roads is a little bit hidden to people who are just kind of kind of uh, rapidly going over them at 70 miles an hour or or 80 or however fast you uh, sometimes <laughs> you go so fast over uh, over freeways these days that uh, that uh, the the images of them just kind of uh, just kind of skate through but uh, yeah it's it can be hard to see and it really does take uh, somebody to look at it closely it takes engineers to look at it and sometimes the the damage that can occur in roads really is hidden on the surface until the crack major crack ups really start and it is one of those things that uh as with a lot of medical conditions and a lot of other things it's a lot less costly uh if you catch it very early than it is later on after the damage is done and you and you virtually have to rebuild the whole thing 
On another topic, Friday I was talking to one of my coworkers who was telling me about a great restaurant in town that he, he thought I should try out because he said, this restaurant has fresh potatoes. He said, when you come to Idaho, you expect that because you can pretty much pick them up in anybody's backyard. And he was criticizing restaurants. He, he was telling me that serve uh, frozen potatoes. Agriculture is such a huge part of industry in Idaho in this day and age. And yet there is some concern. Something you reference uh, on, the, on the report that I noticed about uh, a proposal in Washington being backed by our two U.S. senators, and it's called this, the acronym is SCRAP Act. Uh, and that's, that's about farmers really concerned that they're being overregulated in this day and age, and it's cutting into their bottom lines. It's uh, there's there's uh, long been uh, been talk about that, and well, of course, uh, the congressional delegation in, from Idaho has long been interested generally in uh, in a lot of these a lot of industrial regulations overall, of which food processing is a part. Uh, so that's uh, you know that's naturally going to be part of the uh, part of the issue that they're going to deal with, and it's uh, it's certainly something that that uh, wins some support in Idaho. And, and and I guess that if, you, if you're looking at it from the other side, you're concerned about pesticides in your food, and you're concerned about perhaps the quality of the food. Uh, is there some sort of effort to balance all of this out? Well, the, the prob- part of the problem is that that a lot of the the work and regulation hasn't been done as effectively as it should be. Uh, there's uh, if you if you look at at the question of how often are for example, inspections on uh, in food processing plants done. In many cases, they're very rarely done, and uh, so it it you kind of have a couple of things going on. One is that that sometimes you get uh, you get regulations that don't necessarily do the job, and that can be onerous. But on the other hand, the regulation isn't uh, isn't regularly or efficiently enough performed that it that it provides the safeguards that a lot of other people are hoping for. About this time on every Monday morning, Randy Staples joins us from Idaho Weekly Briefing and spends a few minutes with us. It's coming up on 10 minutes of 9 o'clock and 19 at our studios at News Radio 1310 KLIX, as well as online at News Radio 1310.com. This is Bill Colley on Top Story. And, and Randy, a couple of other points. Uh, well, one other point really about the, the national political scene in Idaho. You referenced the fact that uh, there has been some thought that there might be a primary challenge coming up in a U.S. Senate race. But uh, at the moment, uh, Raul Labrador, who's uh, in the House and has a pretty good seat there, I think safe seat, has maybe decided he's not going to be making a challenge uh, for a U.S. Senate anytime soon. He does seem to have uh, have indicated that pretty clearly. There was uh, there was some talk last year that uh, that Mike Crapo, who is up in sixteen, uh, he made a ref. He, he said that he planned to run again in twenty sixteen. Now that's pretty early for uh, for that kind of an announcement. Usually, you don't a member of of the Senate wouldn't make that kind of announcement until say later on this year, toward the, maybe toward the end of this year. So he was making it more than a year in, uh, earlier than, than normally would be the case. But uh, there were, the thought was that, that he may have been doing that in part to try to ward off uh, any, any major primary challenge, and major primary challenge would presumably come from Labrador. Uh, last week, Labrador seemed to indicate pretty clearly again that he didn't plan to Engage in that kind of a that kind of a fight. If it if it actually did happen, it would be a really major fight. It would be a, a huge, big primary battle that would really thoroughly engage the state. It would uh, it would be a major fight, but uh, that looks pretty likely not to happen. And and for a long, long time, whenever I would hear Labrador's name mentioned on a TV show, it was always preceded by Tea Party Hero, which of course is not his first name. But it, it, it does it does appear that his um, his shooting star has cooled somewhat. It may have to a degree, but he's still uh, he's, he gets described uh, by a number of people as as something of a rock star. In uh, within his first district, he will draw pretty large crowds when he has town meetings and things like that. And uh, yeah, it's it the trajectory up isn't uh, it, it seems to have slowed some. Uh, that may be only a few headlines or a few uh, few appearances away from recapturing a little bit of fuel. Uh, he's, he's 
still in a pretty strong position, and were he to run for, say, governor in 2018, which is entirely still entirely possible, and a lot there are a lot of people, in fact, who do simply expect him to do that, he'd be in a very strong position to take that race. Unless, of course, maybe Brad Little is suddenly sitting there. Well, that's a, unless, uh, if he's sitting there, it would be a very interesting thing to do to see whether uh, whether Labrador would wind up taking him on. And there would be, I'm not sure that I would rule that out either, if, that's, uh, if that were the case, because they really do kind of represent distinctive uh, areas, distinctive portions of the Republican Party. We should point out 853 at our studios at News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. We've just reached 20, so it does look like we will finally break out of the teens and warm up a little bit today. Uh, here we are coming down to the last, uh, you know, the real crunch time, I would imagine, starts uh, in the next uh, 30 days in, in Boise. Anything that we should be looking at that's going on in state government, uh, especially among legislators, that is going to be really contentious over the next few weeks? Well, I would uh, I would start with I would say there are two things to to really look at right now. One is transportation, which we talked about a little bit a uh, little bit earlier. That has been a topic that has been a a big uh, issue, a really difficult, tough issue for legislators and governors to deal with over the last dozen years and more. It's uh, it's it's been a very difficult one, and this year is is likely to be the same. Uh, Right now, they seem to be fairly well positioned and just loose enough in their in their positioning that that there's a possibility they could work out some sort of a compromise. But uh, that's that's a very sensitive topic. And the other one, of course, is is public school broadband and whether they'll be able to uh, what they'll be able to do with that uh, and and how they'll be able to make that work for the schools around the state. That's a very difficult one. Those are the two big challenges, I think, as they uh, as they head into the next few weeks. We haven't heard anything yet this morning. I, I would imagine that because of the stopgap, as the, the phrase was used last week, a measure that when most people return to their schools today, they did have broadband. It was not shut off. That's uh, that's at least the expectation, and we'll see how that uh, how that plays. That that may be the case, but it may not last for very long either. And there's there's really some question about how the legal and financial agreements in connection with all that will will wind up working out and whether they can last for very long. There may have been a sense that, well, if there's some question like that, let's try and keep it going for the time being. And I I think there was some of that logic that, that came from last fall. Even when the contract was declared void, the contract didn't, didn't immediately just flip the switch and uh, darken the schools. There was uh, there, there seemed to be some feeling that that uh, when in doubt, kind of keep it going for a little bit longer at least. And so that may may keep things going for a little while, but I wouldn't necessarily say that what they've got right now is going to buy them a lot of time. Randy, for people who'd like to take a look at the briefing, uh, where would you send them? I would send them to rydenbaugh.com. That's www.r-i-d-e-n-b-a-u-g-h.com. And before we wrap up, got about a minute to left. With this whole broad, uh, a minute left in the uh, that segment, with this whole broadband issue, is it possible that somebody down the line somewhere could face maybe some sort of criminal action? It's that's not inconceivable, because the kind of thing that uh, that's been been talked about at this point, you would need to get into into some kind of a charge of corruption. Uh, I'm I'm not sure that that's that that has necessarily happened. I'm certainly not going to make the make the accusation myself, but uh, but it's uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that it's inconceivable. Depending on what an investigation might turn up, uh, there have been charges of uh, of corruption or or things like that in cases that are not so terribly different from this. And I uh, I'd be watching to see whether something like that happened. Although that would have to come out of an AG's office. Uh that might not necessarily want such a controversy at this point? Uh, probably not the AG's office, although that would be possible, but uh, but the feds are another possibility. Sure. Uh, Washington, on the other hand, might see this as a ripe opportunity. It uh, it could be. They, they could possibly get involved in this. I want to thank you much for your time again this week, and quickly again for the people who'd like to check out the site, uh, the, the address again. It is www.ridenbauch.com. Super. We'll talk again next week.
Sounds good. We'll talk to you then. All right. Take care. Randy Staples joining us this morning. Idaho Weekly Briefing, spending a few minutes with us talking about some of the issues going on. The governor is, is expected to join us tomorrow, but just for a few minutes. He's doing a whole string of radio stations in one hour. We had hoped to get him on the air for about 10 to 15 minutes, but we're going to at least have to uh, settle for about five minutes tomorrow. But uh, he is aware we're, we're probably talking about the, the broadband issue, along if there's any time left uh, in that five minutes, along with the, uh, well, the transportation issue, which is clearly the other dominant topic going on at the state capitol. Coming up on 9 o'clock, news from Fox. One more hour of Bill Colley with you on Top Story this morning on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. 20 at our studios. Of course, Rush, Rush Limbaugh, there you go. Rush Limbaugh will be along following news. At, see, that's what happens when you drink too much on the air. Rush Limbaugh will be along after 10 o'clock news. I'm sure he'll have something to say about the Oscar snub last night of American Sniper. You know that's coming up. In fact, you may hear it as well from Sean Hannity after 1 o'clock news and, of course, from Glenn Beck following news at 4 o'clock this afternoon right here on News Radio 1310 KLIX. A friend of mine just sent me a note about, uh, uh, I was just briefly mentioning earlier in the last hour about terrorist threats in the United States. He sent me a rather interesting email and uh, he thinks it's actually, uh, put it this way, a scam to try and influence the decision on voting for Homeland Security funding. And there's a terrorist warning out, uh, even though they refuse to refer to Islamic terrorism as Islamic terrorism in the White House, they're warning today at DHS, Department of Homeland Security, uh, they are warning that, uh, that right-wing extremists, that is Tea Partiers, are ready to uh, go out and start uh, apparently causing all sorts of havoc across the country. So... Americans, uh, red-blooded, patriotic Americans, bad. Islamic terrorists don't exist. And I'm going to get to a telephone caller in just a minute on the program, but I'd like to mention, too, as well, our good friends at Western States Bus Services, where they're hiring part-time bus drivers right now. Split shifts, five days per week, summer's off, and scheduled no school days. Pay is $10.75 per hour. You can apply today by contacting 733-8003. Western States Bus Service is an equal opportunity employer. Eight minutes after nine o'clock. Bill Colley with you. 20 degrees at our studios at News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com, which is our website. We can be heard anywhere around the world. 736-0300. We have a telephone caller, I believe, with us who's been trying to reach us for quite a few minutes. And you're up next. You're on the air. What's on your mind this morning? Good morning. I'd like to comment about, you know, the food. Uh, safety and so forth, and uh, and uh, the, generally speaking, the Americans producers here we have the safest food supply in the world, and it's really one of the main functions of government is to protect us and uh, protect our health. And yet we're importing uh, so much food now from foreign countries that uh, we're 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 growing pork. Chickens here, we're sending it to China, and I guess the processing plants are just absolutely horrendous. And then they're shipping it back over here in finished products. And you can find those products, and and right now they're still labeling, but they're trying to roll up the um, trade organization is trying to stop the country of origin labeling. But, you know, we have an obligation from our government to protect us from all kinds of diseases, and we see how the immigration thing is probably bringing in measles, and now we're bringing in all kinds of food that we don't know anything about the inspections. And certainly the Chinese are not going to let American food inspectors over there because I understand from the reports it's just horrible. But here's the bottom line uh -huh. talking about regulations. Uh -huh. You know, we, we have about $15,000 a year is the cost of regulations. We're just being totally overregulated. And just last year alone, there were 79,000 pages printed in the Federal Register um, of more rules and regulations to just eat out our substance. And, and you know, when you think about that, that $15,000 a year cost, people wonder why Americans have, uh, they don't have a, a pot to pee in when they retire is because they're paying for all of the regulations. I thank you much for the call. And a couple of things about that to note. When I go, I love sweet onions. Uh, Vidalia onions, one of my favorites of all time. They're grown in Georgia. 
probably the best tasting onion I've ever found. But what disappoints me is I go into a store and I'll go looking for sweet onions and the ones that I usually find aren't grown here. <laughs> They're from some other country. They're imported here. And we're, well, you know, it's got, we've got to help them and lift them up because if we find jobs for them, then they won't be angry. Well, yeah, but what about my fellow countrymen who are angry? Well, they're right-wing extremists who are going to go out and cause all sorts of problems. Well, they wouldn't be right-wing extremists if you didn't keep giving away their birthright, what they earned, what their parents earned, what their grandparents earned. <sighs> I don't understand this. Years ago, one of my bosses was uh, shopping at a Dollar Tree. He just ran in there to pick up a couple of small things, and he started looking at some of the canned goods. For years, I had these canned goods on my desk at my last job because he brought them in and gave them to me. It was from all of this stuff that was canned in China. And he said to me, a lot of these uh, vegetables and uh, the peaches as well that he brought in, canned peaches from China, he said, used to be grown right around here. He said, they're not any longer. So you go into one of these Dollar Tree stores and all of the people who are shopping there, who are forced to shop there, I guess, because they can't afford anything else, are buying. It's not just that we have to go to Walmart and buy all of the cheap trinkets that China manufactures. But now you go to buy food and you're supporting Chinese business that way. It just, it, it, it's somebody out there has some sort of intention here that isn't very nice when it comes to your future or the future of your children or the future of your grandchildren. 12 minutes after 9 o'clock. And they wonder why some Americans, flag waving patriots, might start to become radicalized. It's 21 at our studios. Bill Colley with you on News Radio 1310 KLIX, as well as all around the world online at NewsRadio1310.com. The Department of Homeland Security. Well, you know, there has been a big argument because Republicans have passed a bill, but they're not going to fund amnesty. Media is not telling you that part. They're just saying, oh, Republicans are being bad and they're not being liberals. Liberals are good. Republicans aren't liberals. Re Republicans are bad. So here we go. Homeland Security could shut down. Now, I've never met a liberal who thought it was a very good idea to have a Department of Homeland Security when it was created right after 9-11. But now that Republicans won't play ball with them, well, wait a minute here. This is a wonderful department. And the deadline looms. I think it's a little later this week, middle of the week, for funding Homeland Security. A friend of mine sent me an email. He says, and voila, all of a sudden, there's a Somalian, a Somalian threat, not that there's any who live around here, to blow up malls in the United States. And he said, poof, it just comes out of nowhere. Because some Somali video showed a picture of the Mall of America. And his view is that this is all being done as a scare tactic to motivate people to go ahead and pass extension of the Homeland Security Bill, and that is keeping the doors open. So we also, by the way, can go about granting amnesty to tens of millions of people who don't belong here. Yeah, wouldn't that be the way it works in Washington? No, nah, they would never pull anything like that, would they? Meanwhile, President Obama, all of his minions at the State Department over at the Justice Department, and over at the Department of Homeland Security. A lot of redundancy going on here, I know, but it helps them provide jobs for liberals who otherwise wouldn't be employable. They are all saying that when it comes to Islamic extremism, there is no such thing as Islamic in that, and it would be mean and, and rotten to do that. On the other hand, the people who remain working at the Department of Homeland Security have issued a new report. This from Kellen Howell at the Washington Times. The Homeland Security Report predicts that most sovereign citizen violence in 2015 will occur during a routine law enforcement encounter or at a suspect's home. That means when the SWAT team's kicking down your door and perhaps getting the wrong house. Uh, during enforcement stops and at government offices. That according to CNN, which is picking up this story, leaked to the Communist News Network. And going back to the top of the story, a new Department of Homeland Security intelligence assessment circulated this month focuses on the threat of right-wing sovereign citizen extremist groups in the U.S. Yeah, all seven of them. <laughs> you've, got, you've got Islamists all over the world burning people alive, chopping people's heads off, blowing up school buses, and yet in this country, that's, uh, that's just considered violence, but it's not Islamic violence, of course. We have to really be worried about people who believe in the Constitution and their liberties. That's what we have to be concerned about in America, and I'm glad the Obama White House is on this. In other words, people who didn't vote for President Obama are very suspect. The new assessment, the writer says, comes as President Obama is holding a conference to focus on efforts to fight violent extremism, while the White House has come under fire for its refusal to use the term Islamist extremism during the talks. There has been very little discussion on the domestic terror threat 
from sovereign citizen groups. They issued this a few years ago, similar report, and they backed off of it because once it got leaked, there was criticism. They were saying that the violence would come from American troops who were returning from overseas having fought for their country. And we had, to, we had to watch out for them. So, you know, when you go down the street, don't worry about Abdul there who's carrying that bomb with a lighted fuse. No, if you see somebody who's just gotten off a plane and wearing their uniform still, remember, that is a very dangerous individual, according to the United States government. 916, Bill Colley with you on News Radio 1310, KLIX, and NewsRadio1310.com. And you can reach our program today at 736 0300, 736 Zero three hundred. So there'll be another summer where uh, we're told that there are evil people who want to graze their cattle on federal lands, which of course were appropriated by the federal government without your permission. And then it'll be said, well, they're not nice people because uh, they they don't uh, hang out with people of color, so they're therefore bad, and uh, they're right wing extremists because they want to live the way that their forefathers did. All over again, it's just repeat performance every year, and it just it's relentless. And the devil is relentless like that. He keeps probing for openings. And he just keeps it. You can turn him back. He's going to show up the next day and look for another one. I've said it a lot on the radio. And it's bearing, it bears worth repeating. Is that if you are doing business, and this is my hypothetical. If you own a, just a hardware store on your local main street, wherever you live, and you're busily working one day, and you notice across the street that the devil has moved in and opened up shop in a vac- what had been a vacant store, and the devil is over there doing business, and you ignore it, the devil doesn't really care. The devil will go about uh, grabbing souls off the streets. You know, when they come through the door, he'll make sure that he entices them and uh, gets them on his team, and this will go on and on and on. And he'll leave you alone until the day you suddenly say, I've had enough. And if you walk outside, and as people are walking up and down the street, you start pointing across the street at the store and saying, hey, that's the devil over there. That's the devil in operation. You've got to be careful. Then the devil isn't going to be very happy with you. And that's what we're dealing with with this current government. What Giuliani said last week, that the president didn't like his country, was not a patriot. He was spot on. We're dealing with a minion of the darker world. And no, that's not a reference to the president's color. That's a reference to the infernal reaches. And then when Giuliani said, well, if you're all upset about it, what I really meant was he's a communist. Yes, he is. And these people will stop at nothing to destroy the way that the world used to be. And if you think about it, places like the Mountain West and maybe the Nevada desert, we're about the only places left where we still have some sense of, of nominal liberty. And, and they're trying to take that away from all of us. Coming up on uh, 20 after 9 o'clock, Bill Colley with you this Monday morning on Top Story. 21 right now. News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Very quickly, I'm going to try to squeeze a telephone call around the air with us in the last minute before the break. Uh, you're up next on News Radio 1310 KLIX. And what's up with you? Yeah, Bill, uh, I again, I get to go up to ski at uh, Baldy up in Sun Valley, and I'm always very appreciative of the fact that I get to. But while I'm on the lift, I like to talk to people. I was skiing by myself yesterday, and every every lift ride was a new adventure in, in investigation. And uh, there was a lady there from Vermont or New Hampshire who was <laughs> talking about, well, this was the unique thing about it. She said uh, that the snow was everywhere but on the mountains where we ski and and she says it's funny how it snowed so heavily in the liberal states and in liberal cities and i said to her i says well do you think that somehow god is punishing these people and for some reason we never she never gave me an answer but she was a conservative from the east and and so it was amazing that you could find these people, but I guess they are there. And so, but, uh, you know, another ride, I ran into a guy who was from Michigan and who was from Battle Creek, Michigan, cornflake country. And he, I was talking to him about Detroit and uh, this guy could have been my neighbor. He was so well, fed up with, you so they gotta let you run because I've got a, I've got a hard break here, but uh, at least he wasn't a flake from Battle Creek. More details ahead. Caller was referencing uh, meeting a conservative from the state of Vermont. Actually, when I lived there, and I'm going back almost 15 years ago, 
I lived in Bristol, Vermont, which was heavily Republican territory. The problem is, is that Burlington, which is the biggest city filled with liberals, and Rutland and Brattleboro and, and Montpelier, the state capital, all pretty much the same story. So the old uh, Yankee Republicans there are, have long been outnumbered by all of the people who showed up in Volkswagen buses in 1968, decided to stay and fire pottery. In fact, there was a guy who lived just outside of Bristol. He had a huge kiln. It was about two stories high where he would fire all of his pottery. <laughs> Talk about a hemp clothing wearing, granola chomping, Volvo driving liberal. He was your perfect example of that. And uh, and and of course he he decided once he settled there that he had to remake Vermont in his image. And that's what's happening in those parts of the East. And I was talking to people yesterday at the Home and Garden Show who were telling me the same thing is happening here. That people are showing up from uh, from Washington State and in the coastal areas and the coastal areas of Oregon and California especially. They come here and say, Oh, isn't this lovely? All right, now that it's lovely, we've got to make it look like me and all of my liberal friends. And unfortunately, then they change the character of the place they thought was lovely in the first place. They show up thinking they're going to see Andy and Barney walking down the street, and that doesn't happen, and all of a sudden it's like, we need to change this. You people are intolerant, and this can't go on. Well, then go home. What do you mean, go home? (laughs) Well... You've got your liberal places. We've got our conservative places. I suggest we continue to self-segregate. We'll all get along much better that way. 925, Bill Colley with you this morning. 21 at our studios. News Radio 1310 KLIX, News Radio 1310.com. You can reach the program by dialing me at 736-0300 or by email, and that is bill.colley, that is C-O-L-L-E-Y, bill.colley at townsquaremedia.com. Also wanted to remind you again, Western States Bus Services is hiring part-time bus drivers right now. Split shifts, five days per week, summer's off, and scheduled no school days. Pay is $10.75 per hour. You could apply today by contacting this number. This Got to remember this number, 733-8003. That's 733-8003. Western States Bus Services is an equal opportunity employer. We had talked a little earlier about the fact that they're now labeling Tea Partiers again as extremists, but if you're, a, if you're an Islamic extremist, you're just an extremist. Uh, the, funny how government works this way. And then we mentioned that this threat against some of the malls around the country, including the Mall of America in Minneapolis, a friend of mine says he thinks it's a, it's a ploy to generate funding for, uh, for the amnesty in the Department of Homeland Security budget. Now, Homeland Security, we were told, was created to keep us safe, and now its mission has morphed into bringing, bringing tens of millions of people here who came here illegally, uh, morphed into uh, allowing them to suddenly become American citizens because the president waves a fig leaf at them. Well, when dealing with extremists, and some of those may have actually been among that group, we'll, we'll find out, I guess, after it's all said and done. Washington Examiner has a column today from a writer named Dan Hannon. He is a conservative English politician serving in the European Parliament. And he says, uh, when it comes to dealing with extremists from the Islamic world, the headline is, they'll like us when we win. That's a great point to be made. He says, children of immigrant parents in Amsterdam or Birmingham, England, or Copenhagen, Denmark, are taught from the moment they go to primary school. The liberal nostrums that characterize Europe's state sector, no culture is better than any other. Patriotism is dangerous. The nation state is anachronistic. Everything is acceptable except sexist language and Euroscepticism. Is it any wonder, he writes, that some kids cast around for an identity that seems less insipid? He says, it is here that I fear President Obama may be missing the point. Then again, ringing endorsements of Western values aren't exactly his thing. Virtually his first act on assuming office was to go on a world apology tour, telling delighted European audiences that America had been too arrogant and too ready to resort to force. He says the Euro panty waist lapped it up, of course, but they weren't the only people listening. It emboldened our enemies. And yes, they are the enemies of all civilization. And I think he's bringing up a very good point. You know how you defeat them? You crush them. I hear people say all the time, you can't do that because then the children will grow up and they'll be hostile and that will just create more terrorists or terrible public relations. You know, in World War II, when the Germans took over most of Europe, 
There's all these great stories about the French resistance. Do you realize the French resistance was tiny? Most most Frenchmen were like, "Oh, this is my sister. Go ahead, you you you. I'll tell you what, there, Heinz. You want her? You take her. <laughs> Let me drink my wine." You know, half the children born in France uh, for four years had German parentage. They were not fighting in all of these uh, these uh, these uh, wooded areas of France. There were only a handful of people. It was politicians later on who claimed they were members because it helped them get elected. You see how that worked. Uh, they made it up, and no one could deny that they were actually there because they didn't keep membership roles for safety reasons. But most people in Europe were simply cowed by the Nazis. So this notion that if you have a heavy hand with people, that you're somehow going to inspire them to more uh, violent acts, I don't believe it's true. And people who keep claiming that, they do not have the evidence to back it up. Coming up on 9.30, one more half hour with Bill Colley this morning on Top Story. On News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Got about four minutes here, so I guess I can take the Times News and rush down to the men's room. I'm not actually reading it, of course. You can reach me in the next half hour at 736 0300. 22 at our studios right now. Look, plenty more to talk about today. Here's an interesting story on a lighter note young people don't watch TV any longer. We, uh, talking a little bit about uh, that controversy last week earlier that took place with uh, Rudolph Giuliani, former mayor of New York City, calling the president out for saying, not a patriot. Then when someone said, that's not being nice, because you've got to be nice to everybody today. If the liberals had their way, that would be law. Well, they're working on it. But so he turned around and said, well, let me clarify. He's a communist. What? You can't say that. So it, it really got out of hand. But the, the, the left immediately sprung into action saying, well, this has been going on with this poor man for years. Even Michael Smirconish, who used to be a conservative, but thought when President Obama was elected in 2008, the country had changed. And Smirconish showed his true colors by just you know morphing into a liberal at that point. He went on his TV show on CNN, which, of course, nobody saw. But I saw a video of it over the weekend. And he said, people are being mean to the president. He said, these people who claim he's a Muslim, these people who claim he's not patriotic, these people who claim he's a communist. And but, but why is it that people would think that the man is not a Christian? Because that came up too as well. When Scott Walker was asked about it all the weekends, uh, over the weekend, Walker said, I don't know. I, it's not a big topic for me. And he said, why don't you go ahead and cover something really newsworthy? And that only made the press angrier. It's like he was supposed to stand there and say, yes, President Obama is a Christian. I know that deep within my own heart. Because that's what media wants people to say so they can, media isn't going to ask that question itself. But they want other people to answer it, put other people on the spot. Well, there is a reason a lot of people simply don't know, according to the columnist Byron York, who if, if you watch any Fox News, you'll see Byron York on as one of the occasional talking heads. And he writes for a number of uh, right-wing publications in this country, which I'm not saying is a bad thing. But he has a column at, at Washington, uh, Washington Examiner, actually, where he says, in August 2010, a Pew poll uh, made news when it found that 18% of those surveyed believe the president is a Muslim. Now, that's what, less than one in five. And the name might be one reason you would think that. He writes, though, just as notably, and this is what media failed to really focus on, 43% of respondents in that survey told Pew they didn't know Obama's religion. Among those who said they didn't know were 41% of Democrats. Gee, did anyone bother to tell you that? No, of course not. So that was 2010. And then later, two years later, the Pew did a similar survey. In 2012, another election year, Pew asked the question again and found that 36%, still more than one-third of Americans, did not know the president's faith. When they were asked, they said, I don't know. So Reverend writes church. Believe me, that's not Christianity. That's just hate. Even lefty had to admit that. So 51% correctly identified the same year Mitt Romney as a Mormon. 45% 45% had been able to say President Obama was a Christian. So Obama had been in office on TV every day for a few years by then, right? Almost four years. And while campaigning, maybe make it six years. And still more people knew Mitt Romney was a Mormon. Well, of course, media wanted to try to tell you that because even though they claim they're not, uh, that, that they're not prejudiced in these situations, they don't like Mormons because they're generally conservative people. So... They were hammering away, hoping that would separate you know, liberal voters from Mitt Romney in that situation. 
fact, I remember during that campaign, Keith Ogerman came on his show on MSDNC. Was he still there at the time? Or had he gone over to Al Gore's uh, Fruitcake Network? Uh, anyway, he came on his TV show, and he, he came out attacking Joseph Smith, calling him a con man and a charlatan. And I thought, wow, I wonder if he would ever do that about Muhammad. Of course not. He wouldn't survive the walk home after he got off his show. Well, he's got to be walking. He's a liberal. He wouldn't ride in a limo, right? <clears throat> York says there is a reason a lot of people don't know the president's faith. George Bush, his predecessor, while in office, went to church 120 times in, in eight years. Now, a lot of times what they'll do as a president, you don't want to disturb somebody at their own church, make them wait for hours to come in while it's all swept, and then make them wait for another hour after you've left. One of the reasons Ronald Reagan didn't go to church on a regular basis outside the White House, they would have people come into the White House and minister to them in those situations. But President Bush attended church services outside the White House 120 times in eight years. In President Obama's first five years, his spokesman said Obama had gone to churches 18 times. So five times, more than five times as often President Bush went to church. If you see pictures of him on the news coming out of a church, you might think he's a Christian. If you never see any pictures of President Obama coming out of a church, how would you know? Because he so rarely does it. And when he does it, it's usually to go make a political speech there. And keep this in mind. If you, if you make conservative remarks in a church, you're going to be in violation of that 1954 law enshrined by then-Senate Majority Leader Communist Lyndon Johnson that says you'll lose your tax exemption as a church. But if you're President Obama or Jesse Jackson or John Kerry and you go into church and make a liberal speech, then that's okay. That's not a violation of the law. That's how that works in this country. 20 minutes away from 10 o'clock this morning. We have another short break to hear from some more of our fine sponsors right here at News Radio 1310, KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. You can hear us on the web anywhere around the world. 22 at our studios. Bill Colley with you on Top Story this morning. Also, just a reminder Rush Limbaugh following news at 10 o'clock. And then Sean Hannity following news at 1 o'clock. Following 4 o'clock news, Glenn Beck. So quite a bit still ahead on the program today. And as I said earlier, I had some opening comments about the uh, Academy Awards ceremonies last night and how they tried their best to squeeze out of giving the Best Picture the Best Picture Award. That was American Sniper. Rest assured, some of these fellows, the national talkers coming up, are going to address that today. Here's a, another reason not to uh, send your kids to public school and consider homeschooling. Daily Caller has this, and it's being done in Massachusetts. It will only spread through the Common Core network around the country. Education bureaucrats in about half the 50 states are currently pursuing strategies that will ask students to choose their lifelong professional employment paths as early as the sixth grade. <laughs> I just, I, I hadn't even started delivering papers yet, or it was right around that time, I guess I did. And I knew that wasn't what I was going to do the rest of my life. I, I thought I might do some other things, and I was more interested in the paper route because it helped me buy my bubblegum cards. 944, Bill Colley with you, 23, at our studios. News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com means you can hear us anywhere around the world, and you can reach our program today at 736 0300. That is 736 0300. I liked listening to the radio as a kid. It's funny. I always thought it would be fun to be on the radio. But it never really became my ultimate pursuit. It was one of those things as a high school kid, even through college. I had my eye on doing three or four different things that I thought I would like doing. And I never expected to be a radio talk show host. I thought I would probably spin some records, as we called them in those days. And then I ended up in news, and I thought, this is where I'll spend my life. And now I'm hosting a talk show instead. And I've been doing that really for most of the last dozen years. But I, I don't remember anyone even trying to pressure me. I think in the, the, the 10th grade, 9th or 10th grade, our guidance counselor, he was a wonderful man. He was one of my dad's distant cousins. And he had, uh, he had been uh, shot down during uh, the Korean War, escaped a prison camp twice. Tough guy. I mean, you really admired him. But he kept telling me in the ninth or 10th grade, I really should know what I wanted to do with my life at that point. What? I'm, I'll be 53 this coming October. I still don't know what I want to do with my entire life. And I hope if I live long enough, I'll get a couple of other opportunities out there too as well. But here you go, trying to convince children. 
There, it, there was a movie version of it a few years ago, but some of you may have, especially when you were in school, back when we still read classical literature, you may have been forced to plow through a book called A Brave New World, where people were literally genetically engineered for jobs at birth. So there were people who were about four feet high and uh, with, uh, with eyes developed for living underground who were miners. And, and that's what they were developed for this. And, and, and they just simply, well, now you've got people who are actually uh, birthing babies from genes spliced together from three parents and not two. And, and so we're not that far away from it. And I think when you hear the sinister people say, well, people should know what they want to do when they're really, really little. It's more of an effort to move us off in that direction. The writer says, the goal of the project is to have students as young as 11 years old defining careers for themselves and completing coursework within student learning plans that will lead to those careers. Say, I see your aptitude is to pick up my garbage, so here, you know, take this shovel. I'm going to teach you how to use it. But I, I, I want to be a sportscaster. Sorry, kid. Yeah, no, 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 no future for you. Oh, I want to be a teacher. No, can't do it. We've already decided this is what you're going to do with the rest of your life. And you know what? Your parents aren't, uh, they don't come out and hang out with us on weekends and buy us drinks. So you're going to have to do whatever we tell you to do. That's how it worked in my school. I kid you not. If your parents hung out in all the right, uh, uh, there, were, there was all of these people lived in the biggest houses on South Street, which was the really ritzy neighborhood in my hometown. The big old uh, colonial and Victorian home sat there. And if your parents lived in one of those homes, they normally went to this. We had a small town of about 3,000 people. Village had about 1,700. Town had about 3,000. And, of course, <clears throat> back in those days, there weren't politically correct issues or laws about certain things. So there were 14 places where someone could buy a drink. I remember my dad counting them up with me one time as we were driving down the road trying to figure out how many. Which is why on Saturday mornings, he would always take me down to the junkyard uh, that was our activity weekend mornings on Saturdays. It was always to go to the junkyard to look at all the wrecks from the previous night from all of the drunks. But if your parents lived in one of the big houses on South Street, then they went and they hung out at a place called Moonwinks, which was where all of the expensive drinkers went. You know, the, they charged two or three times as much for a beer as you might at a regular beer joint. And all of the school teachers and administrators would also hang out in there. So if your parents were hanging out with them, you got pushed into what was called the A group. And you got pushed into one of those A careers. But if your parents, my parents were not among that group, you got pushed into, I was probably as bright as the A kids, but I got into the B group. So I was going to be groomed for some other, from, from grade school on, groomed for some other career, uh, but not a professional career. And then if you're, you know, if you could end up in the C group and the poor kids in the D group, it was, you know, why didn't you just tell them, look, hey, welcome to kindergarten. Uh, we know you're going to drop out before the age of 16, but... Uh, just hang around with the D group over there and, and, and just keep your mouth shut. Otherwise, you'll be spending all day in the principal's office. That seems to be how it worked. Now, we're, we're going to enshrine it with these new plans that you see that are being recited today in the Daily Caller. A woman by the name of Jane Robbins, she is a senior fellow with the American Principals Project. She had this to say, to me, this is one more indication that we have lost our collective minds. <laughs> Well said. I mean, I just couldn't say it better myself. Uh, Reverend Governor Mike Huckabee is coming up shortly with a Huckabee report right here on News Radio 1310 KLIX, brought to you exclusively by the financial advisors at Waddell and Reed in Twin Falls, 736 6563. That number again, Waddell and Reed in Twin Falls, 736 6563. Oh, I'm just looking at a graphic up on my monitor here. American Sniper has grossed $320 million at the box office. Uh, Birdman, not even a tenth of that. There you go. Politically correct movies. Thank you very much, Governor Huckabee. And just to quickly recap, the Huckabee Report is brought to you Monday through Friday exclusively by the financial advisors at Waddell and Reed in Twin Falls, 736-6563. Got a couple of just quick things to mention as we wrap up the program in the next three minutes. Coming up on 955 24 at our studios. Bill Colley with you on uh, News Radio 1310 KLIX, also around the world on the web at newsradio1310.com. And you can email me, uh, show wrapping up today, but if you've got anything you want to, like to comment about or mention for tomorrow, bill.colley at townsquaremedia.com. That last name spelled C O L L E Y. I got a call, an urgent call at home on Saturday morning uh, from someone very special to me. And she was telling me that uh, she had forgotten, left her, and the weather was bad. She had left her telephone charger. Her charger was at work. 
and work was 40 minutes away. But she had a backup she could use to charge in the car. And she said, will that run down my battery? I said, no. Actually, if you've got the charger on and you're running the vehicle, like you're driving, it will charge. But if you turn the key off, the charge stops. It will not drain your battery. And I, I said, so if you go shopping, you plug that phone in, you'll juice it up. She ended up driving all the way 40 minutes, I believe, to go to work to pick up that, uh, that particular uh, phone charger that day. Uh, in bad weather, I should point out. People are, when you don't have a cell phone any longer, you feel as if you are, the few times I have left the house and left it behind, and I never owned one until 2006, I feel positively naked. Well, okay, maybe not naked. And you really wouldn't want that anyway. Uh, trust me, it frightened everybody. I mean, just, but it's one of those situations that it just, when you don't have the service of that phone, you really are out there. It's one of those things that we've grown so accustomed to, we just can't seem to live without. Over at the Wall Street Journal today, our one wish, longer battery life. Apparently, polls taken of the American people about things that they want. Uh, they don't want necessarily liberty. They want longer battery life. The writer says, unlike microchips, there is no Moore's Law for batteries. It's, it's the amount of energy of a new battery technology can store goes up even a small amount in a year. It's considered progress. That leaves makers of smartphones in particular struggling heroically to reduce the energy consumption, consumption of every component in their devices. Yet even as displays become sharper and microchips faster, we are stuck charging our phones every chance we get. Years ago, I was... Uh, doing an interview with one of these granola chompers. This was the early 1990s, and he was promoting electric cars. Got to save the planet. Of course, he he, he didn't say how uh, we were going to get around in them beyond, you know, the 55, 60-mile limit before they die and just turn into a brick on the road. But he said, oh, battery technology will be greatly improved in just a few years. There should have been some foreshadowing. I was interviewing him outside of a newspaper in Syracuse, New York, newspaper building in Syracuse, New York, and at the intersection nearby, all of a sudden, one car ran the red light and crashed into another. Crunch, right in the middle of the interview. And yet he just kept talking. He looked over for a minute, went back to talking about how it was going to be wonderful that batteries would be so greatly improved that we would be able to store power, that we would be able to drive hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles with electric automobiles. But it hasn't happened. Of course, none of these guys have ever been able to answer the question, how are you going to fuel that electricity? when you're burning oil and, co oil and coal to do it. See, well, but we get back to that whole notion, if we just put up enough of those pinwheels, you still can't do it, folks. We aren't there. We are not there. <sighs> Build the dang pipeline, folks. Get that out of the way. We'll be much better off. Jill and Anwar, much better off. For the at least entire next century, we are going to have to deal with that. And I don't care how much smoke you're blowing, no pun intended. Rush Limbaugh is coming up in just a few minutes following news at 10 o'clock from Fox. 24 at our studios. I'm Bill Colley. This is Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. God willing, and the creek don't rise. I'm back here tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. Hope to see you all then.